Hello, and welcome to Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. This is part two of a two-part episode where we'll be talking to Drs. Paula Como and Christina Hargis about plant blindness in children's art. If you haven't listened to part one, we recommend that you do that now. Once we know that people have plant blindness, what can we do to combat it? What other areas suffer from similar kinds of blind spots? How can things like Harry Potter, home gardening, and your local grocery store help address these problems? Answers to all these and more coming right up. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Now that we've talked about the actual results, let's talk about the implications of this research. So now that you know pretty concretely that plant blindness is a a little bit of an issue um, across all sorts of different age ranges. Uh, what what do you do with that knowledge? Um, not only just for you know people who are developing the curriculum for these students, or for people developing those field guides like you were originally working on, but also just the general public. Like, what do we? What can we do about this? Well, I think kind of as you alluded to earlier, the first part of combating plant blindness is making people aware that they are plant blind. And most people, once they're made aware of this, are a little bit more aware of the plants in their surroundings. They they may not know what they're looking at, but they're at least beginning to notice that there are different things in the community that they are looking at. And so I think that is, that is the first part. Um, in terms of impacts of a vast population globally not recognizing uh, the the impacts of plant blindness. I I use this example in my paper, and I'll, it's been used before by other authors, um, but I'll stick with it. It's like trying to save the panda, but, you know, putting bamboo flooring into all the homes. You know, there's a disconnect between animal needs in terms of habitat and plant community and you know, saving that animal. We're, we're all about the flagship panda, but we forget that the bamboo forests are required in order to save the panda. Um, and I know there's going to be people listening that go, well, there's, you know, fields and, you know, we're not harvesting bamboo from the forest, but kind of that's, that's my best example of the impacts of this um, phenomenon and why we need to be more aware and address it more directly. And I, I think of as as doing things about it, I mean, it's it's a lot of it is getting kids out there, getting them outside, um, having people look at the plants around them from a young age. Uh, a good example. So I we built our house. My husband and I built a house about six years ago and we put in a lawn. And of course, the first thing that comes up in a lawn is all the weeds, essentially. And so. We had a a couple lawn care companies come out and I was actually horrified in the process because I had there was three lawn care companies and they came out to tell me what was there so that they could tell me how to take care of it. And I couldn't hire any of them because there was one that completely misidentified every single every single grass species in my yard. They were like, you have such a problem with foxtail barley. There was not a single blade of foxtail barley in my yard. I can tell you that. It was barnyard grass is what was there. And there was a ton of it. And it's this misunderstanding. And so these are people giving recommendations. And yeah, okay, you could say, okay, well, the chemicals that kill one kill the other. Um, that's fine, but that's not always accurate. And so there's there's this deeper understanding. And so starting with educating people at a young age is important. And there's there's fun ways to do it too. So we talk about in the paper... Actually, uh, there's there's been you use popular media can be part of it. So when Harry Potter came out, there was some interesting pieces where groups specifically in Europe would talk about the mandrake plant and how it was similar to a plant that actually grows on the ground in that country. Or you could talk about plants um, during part of one of the movies. Uh, they take this gilly weed essentially, and he grows gills, which of course you're not going to grow gills, but are there plants that are similar in function? Are there plants that can affect humans in different ways? And of course there are. Um, You could even get into talking about traditional medicines and chewing on echinacea root to numb your mouth if you have a toothache. And so um, it's, it's some of those awarenesses and even edible plants and getting kids to try, you know, wild onion or things like that. 
or using it in a menu. And so, I mean, there's there's lots of things that can be done and they don't have to be extravagant, but getting getting kids at all ages as well as into adulthood looking and paying attention because it's important to know where the pi- poison ivy is so you don't get poison ivy, um, but it's also important for other things too. And I think it's cool because, you know, the more that you're aware of this, you, you can just really find out some of those ecosystem services or just cool features that plants have because it like you said it's it's hard to want to defend something and protect it and take care of it when you don't even know that it's there or that it's important or you know different than something that you maybe maybe wouldn't want to have there you know if a weed looks very similar to another plant that's really useful you know and if you don't know that that's the difference then then why would you want to protect it so to add to that, um, the actual concept for this project was originally based off of an experience I had with a, a cousin of mine who's a lot older. Um, when I was about 12 or 13, he had come with his family to visit myself and my family on our farm in South Dakota. And we were riding on the back of a flat top trailer as one did in the 90s. And he was looking out over the field and we were driving through this big wheat field. And he looked around and he was like, oh... Are, is is this oats? Are we driving through oats right now? And I looked at him like he was the biggest moron on the planet. <laughs> and it was, it was like, no, th- this is wheat. Of course this is wheat. And he's like, oh, well, I'm from the city. I can't tell the difference. And it blew my mind. Because in my mind, like, oats and wheat look very, very different. And it, it made me realize that, you know, this cousin of mine, this family member had had no idea what his food looked like before it was food. And that was concerning to me. And I think that we're also, we're seeing that a lot um, in general within our our global societies as well. People don't know what their food looks like before it's in the Quaker oat box, you know? And this is problematic for farmers and for people within the egg community in general. And to throw on that, and I I really don't mean to keep bringing up Corey's work as well, but Corey was another student that went through at the same time as Paula. And one of the things she looked at was the food systems. And we asked one question in her particular uh, study, and it was, where do buffalo wings come from? And the majority of students in that survey, which were high school, uh, 10th grade biology students, answered that the buffalo wings come from buffalo. Oof. I would like you to show me the wing on a buffalo. I have yet to find that. I have not seen it. Uh, But that was what the majority of students answered. And so, I mean, the same thing is true of plants. And so, like Paula said, um, understanding the difference between what barley and wheat look like. So if you have, you know, say volunteer barley coming up in a wheat field, um, needing to get rid of that or looking at the weeds that are there and understanding, you know, what they are and how they're encroaching. And I mean, there, there becomes so much importance. And then, again, too, of transferring that, knowing how that gets to your table and what that food is that gets to the table and understanding there's differences in, you know, what they look like. It's easier to tell the difference between an orange and an apple um, and, you know, fruiting. But what about the trees, you know, that come from that as well? And so there's a lot of different pieces, whether it's agriculture, the natural world, that become very important for this. And kind of piggybacking off of that, when... We can't see a, a diversity of plants in especially our natural areas, and we can't appreciate that diversity. We begin to um, realize that, you know, while this, this is good, healthy land, let's turn it into more farmland. And that's, you know, kind of been the, the methodology and the mentality in our region for a really long time. And now we're running into this drastic reduction in our pollinators and our pollinator species. And I don't know about you, but I really enjoy my watermelons and I love my blueberries. And most of that pollination is occurring from native bees, not our honeybees, not our domestic bees, but our native bees that need native landscape with very specific native plant communities in order to sustain their life cycle. It's not like they're generalists. Most of them are rather specific in what they need for laying eggs and and reproduction purposes. And when that's not there, we lose them. And then we lose the things that we love the most, our, our blueberries, our watermelons, our oranges. We're already, um, report, there are already reports of reduction in, in pollination. And locally, um, within our Fargo-Moorhead region, the Audubon Society mentioned there are several areas where 
our milkweed plants didn't actually form pods this year. They weren't actually pollinated within city limits. And to me, that's that's a little terrifying. And the fact that we're not seeing that feature on a plant is is scary. And the fact that most people don't realize that it is scary is even scarier. Right. Yeah, totally. And I'd like to add to that a little bit. So, yeah, I, I we work with an entomology department. And so I've I've got a friend that teaches the general entomology class. Um, here on campus, and we've talked about this, and she says the same thing is very true of looking at insects. And so we have a lot of our our, um, crop and weed science students and our agricultural students taking those classes, Um, and so they're going to be farmers in the future. And so we also haven't been trained to see insects. You know, it's not something that's in our face. Like, yes, you might know what a wasp is compared to, you know, a bee or you know what a fly is compared to a horse fly and things like that. Um, but they don't see the different parts. And it's not something that's in your face on a daily basis because they're at a much smaller level. Um, but we need to understand the difference between a soybean aphid uh, that might be uh, on your crops and impacting your crops versus, you know, another species that might need to be treated in a different way or maybe is actually beneficial to that plant. Um, and so it becomes, this is something that's seen not only with plants, but in other things, but it, it encompasses um, the whole agricultural world, basically. Absolutely. Uh, true confession of a podcast host right here. I would also probably fail the weed and oat test. I'm just going to just gonna <laughs> lay it out there. I would fail. And I, I have driven through the country for, for work for like years and I'm like corn I I've got that one I've got corn but like other crops I'm like I have no idea what these are I think I'm getting a handle on soybeans as as time goes on but really I mean since starting this job um I've been here for almost three years now it's only within like the last couple years that I've started to be like oh look at that piece of farm machinery that I don't know what it's called I wonder what it's doing or like paying attention to like Oh, it's harvest time now. Or we we literally just got snow at the at the tail end of October here when we're recording this. And and I was like, oh, well that impacts the people who still need to harvest things. And just like things that you wouldn't think about if you're not in it day to day. And I think that just really ties in here is, you know, I I don't know, you know, I, I have to like look up what does a pineapple bush look like? Because I didn't, I was like, they they certainly have to grow on trees, like a coconut situation. <laughs> and I remember when I found out that's not the case, I was completely flabbergasted. And it's just, it's just things like that you don't know. Fun fact, you can grow your own pineapple by twisting the top off, putting it in water until it sprouts roots, and then planting it. I have three pineapple plants in my house right now from the grocery store. Oh my gosh. That is wild. How, I mean, are they just, do they get really big? Um, they, they're slow growing, uh, especially in our, you know, habitat, which is not at all similar to their own. Sure. Um, but one of mine is now about two feet tall. Wow. So, I didn't, I'm impressed too. I didn't know that. Um, you can also, <laughs> you can grow avocado seeds. They're a little bit harder. But yeah, if, if people are looking for ways to engage with plants, like the grocery store is an amazing place and the food aisle is even better. I've planted strawberries and had strawberries come up, like strawberries that went bad. I've planted um, composting and just into a garden space and seeing what grows is actually fabulous. Our, our local rabbit populations are appreciative as well. Oh, yes. Um, but, yeah, it's the grocery store is a great place to explore with plants. And YouTube offers a whole wealth of opportunities to explore plants through the grocery store. Um, my botany class a few years ago actually did a Mythbusters where they found videos on YouTube and then tried to follow the methodologies and see if the results that the YouTube videos claimed were actually possible and um, avocado seeds and pineapples were, were two of those that were successful and, and people were able to do. So, I mean, I would encourage, if, if, especially if you have kids, there is nothing more fun than twisting the top off of a pineapple and trying to watch the, the roots sprout out of it. It's pretty cool. Well, and, and that, I think, brings up the point, too, of this is it's this is something for everybody. You know, so you came from a different area. Some kids from, come from farms. Some kids come from urban areas. But all of these things can be done in any classroom, can be done anywhere. And it's just, I think it's those little bits that will lead to more 
Uh, and not that everybody needs to know everything about plants. That's that's not necessary. It's not what makes the world go round. But having a base knowledge of it to appreciate it. So in the future, when you're making decisions about it, um, that's what's important. <music> everyone. I hope you're enjoying the show. Interested in learning more? Christina and Paula's article, Analysis of Children's Drawings to Gain Insight into Plant Blindness, published in Natural Sciences Education, will be freely available for the next two weeks. You can find a link to it in our show notes. If you're a certified crop advisor or certified professional soil scientist, there are continuing education units available for this episode. You can find a link to it on certifiedcropadvisor.org or our show notes. Let's get back to the show. For sure. Yeah. Avocado toast fans. Listen in. You heard it here first. Um, I'm sure you didn't hear it here first. <laughs> but um, there you go. I mean, things you know. And I wouldn't even know, like, you'll grow a, an avocado tree? Bush? I, tree, I don't know. Yes. I don't, tree. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Um any any chance to show off my lack of knowledge? <laughs> um, Sorry. Um, no, I'm I'm happy to assist. I'm just proving your research. I'm just corroborating evidence for your work. Um, speaking of, obviously there is much work to be done. So what what are kind of the next steps for future research in this area? I think there's kind of two avenues that we're really interested in exploring and uh, a third avenue that I'm hoping opportunity lends itself to explore. And the first one is obviously looking at different cultures and populations so that the Turtle Mountain community that came back different is really interesting. And generally there's um, still a, a cultural level of importance put on plants within Native American communities. And so we would really love an opportunity to explore um, plant blindness within Native American communities and to see if it holds with our trend, if my one group was an anomaly and the rest would, would fall in line with our general trend, or if there is a difference in the way that population sees plants. Um, in our world, that could be incredibly valuable. If there is a lower level of plant blindness among Native Americans, it could be very impactful for the world of natural resources, and especially in terms of employment and specific roles that need to be done in our field. Uh, the second uh, is to look at early literature. Um, I would love to explore what and how uh, plants are portrayed within children's books and potentially f um, popular films, cartoon films, and see if that cartoon Daisy is just running rampant throughout all early education sources. There was a researcher in Greece that just published papers in 2018 and 2019 that highly criticized the elementary school curriculum and asserted that it may be a root cause for plant blindness and the ways that plants are represented within their curriculum being the cause of some of this. And so I would like to explore that as well. And kind of my third kind of Hail Mary, if I ever get to get to do it, would be to look at traditional medicines and the impact of teaching plants as traditional medicine and to see if that improves plant blindness rates when you add that extra value of it being medicinal, if that improves our ability to see plants and to recognize plants. Oh, that's really interesting. It's like people might have a better job identifying like an apple tree or a rose because they see that as maybe more useful or beneficial to them than different kinds of grass in their lawn. Exactly. Yeah, and I, I think from what Paula said too, I mean, I think these are important at that, that third grade level to see what is being done in some areas where people are absorbing more information um, and how that can then be put into curriculum as well as looking at you know, more of the adults um, going into adulthood, you know, the over 18 where they're easier on the IRB populations. <laughs> uh, but so looking at, too, of what they know and then where they feel that knowledge came from so it can kind of help us to inform these curriculums. Because there is there's great curriculums out there such as uh, Project Learning Tree where it teaches kids about trees and different functions and things like that, as well as Project Food, Land, and People, which is more agricultural based. And so looking at that, um, having 
how can we help inform students earlier through these curriculums that can be given out to teachers a lot of times for free um, for low cost to help them in their classrooms? And another, just adding to that, um, I've done some work with some of our tribal colleges and tribal school districts in North Dakota here in the past. And one of the new curriculums that is catching on, um, at least in North Dakota, is this uh, idea or the, the curriculum that came out of Alaska called Native Ways of Knowing, which is much more based on experiential um, and exploratory knowledge rather than kind of a traditional Western approach to knowledge. And so it would be also interesting to see if that approach to curriculum in schools that are using it has an impact as well. Yeah, and then this is kind of one of those weird side questions I do. So you mentioned early literature, and my brain went to, like, early as in in history rather than, like, in the lifespan of a, of a human. Is there any evidence that this problem is getting better or worse with urbanization or just people not having as much of a connection to their food? Is there any kind of research that, I mean, or you could maybe kind of trace the origins of plant blindness through that at all? Any any thoughts on that? So I don't know that there's any official research. I guess I haven't seen official research on that, but I do some urban ecosystems research, interestingly enough. So when you bring that up, um, and we do see, we see changes in urban ecosystems when you talk about um, urban systems, and there is differences in plants. Um, there are, you know, the the plants that you see in urban areas tend to be more introduced. Actually, you see, it's interesting if you look at along railroad tracks and major roads exiting a city versus entering, you will see a higher um, higher diversity of invasive species and introduced species. Um, and so they, we see those sorts of changes, but it, I would assume, I, I don't know that there's any literature on this, um, but I would assume as we become, so in 2008, for the first time, we became an urban society. Across the world, there was more people living in urban areas than there were in rural areas, and that's expected to never change. We are always expected to have more and more urban um, dwellers, essentially. And so with this, we lose contact with you know, what does soil look like? I've, I've taught a class and it was mostly kids that had lived in um, the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. And I, I just asked, we were talking about soils. And I said, okay, how many of you have ever dug a hole? And I had one student of 12 raise their hand and said, I have dug a hole and looked at the soil. Um, and so it's really hard to teach horizons in a soil and how there's a color change and how texture changes and minerals within that profile change. And so as we move away from a more of an understanding, because in urban areas, kids can't dig soil, you know, necessarily, maybe in their backyard. But what if you hit some sort of electrical wire or pipe or, you know, something like that? And in public areas where it's even more urbanized, you can't dig one in the park. And so as we move away from this, there is less in touch with the natural world. So, I mean, I can only imagine, but I, I haven't specifically looked at or seen literature. No, if if someone would like to fund me in in that, I would love to. Throughout history, there have been several events that have led to persecution of people who do have plant knowledge. Think of the witch trials. A lot of times, witches were women who had uncanny knowledge of plants and healing methodologies. And so I would suspect, and this is me just hypothesizing, that we went through periods where there was a mass extinction of plant knowledge to the point where there are some botanical reference guides from, you know, 14, 15, 16 centuries that we don't really understand the use of. They were, they were coded so that people couldn't use them because it was such valuable knowledge, but they're not useful to us anymore because we, we can't, we don't, we don't know what they mean. Um, and likewise, as European settlement moved across North America, a lot of traditional medicine knowledge was lost. Um, interestingly enough, during the Civil War, the the Confederate Army actually, uh, they contracted a botanist to go figure out medicinal, traditional medicinal plants because their supply of medicine was cut off when they broke from the north, and so they needed other ways of treating wounds. And so they actually had to hire a botanist to go out and figure out how to create medicine for the entire army. And 
you know, I just I think that over time through a series of events that we have lost the knowledge, much like the burning of the library in Alexandria, there have been similar events when it comes to plant knowledge. That is so wild. And now we're just we're bringing in history, we're bringing in cryptography, <laughs> it's just every field of study is just tied into this and I am delighted. But I have been keeping you guys for a long time because this has been such a wonderful conversation. But I do have three questions left for you to bring us home. So first question, we've mentioned tons of resources already. I will do my absolute best to get as many of them as I can into our show notes for this episode. Please check them out. But where can listeners learn more about any of the things that we've been talking about um, but if maybe to narrow the field a little bit, specifically related to this research and field of study. I would say, you know, Google Scholar and searching anything by Wandersee and Schuler, they were the the best. They were they are the granddaddies of or grandmothers of this research. Um, they they're the founders and they are the really uh, the first ones that really named it and applied it. That would be my first go-to. They actually, in the 80s, put out a poster. I'm not sure if we can still get a, a hold of it, but it was actually a poster that was put up in some classrooms. Anything from you, Christina? So I, I, plant blindness is becoming more of an issue, and I shouldn't say more of an issue. We don't know that it is expanding necessarily, but it is becoming more well-known. Uh, to be perfectly honest, you might find some information just by searching, you know, on Google and looking at normal websites, but a lot of it is in the research. But if you're looking at ways of expanding people's plant knowledge, that you can find anywhere. There is great curriculums that are established. Um, I already kind of gave the example of a Project Learning Tree. There is the Project Wet is another good K through 12. There's more water-based, um, but there's some different things with that. Uh, there's a paperback book actually called Lost Plant um, by Schuler and Wandersee, which uh, Schuler is female, <laughs> uh, Wandersee is a male. So we've got a mix of both. We were, weren't sure on that a minute ago. Uh, but so there's there's different books out on it. And there is a plethora of information if you want to expand kids' knowledge on plants. Like Paula talked about just going to YouTube and looking at Mythbusters and ideas, as well as curriculum. I'm sure Pinterest has a billion ideas basically on plants and so there's lots of different references whether you're looking from the academic level down to just the simple google search there's a lot of things that you can increase your plant knowledge and one last thing to add um local and national state parks um are are awesome as well um as as mentioned at the beginning of the show i am the naturalist i'm based out of buffalo river state park uh, and one of the programs that I do every summer is uh, Prairie Preschool. And Prairie Preschool is all about getting kids outside, looking and noticing plants. But as most things are for preschool students, the primary focus is really on helping parents understand how to engage with their youth in um, natural areas. And I wish I could lay claim to the Prairie Preschool program as um, being my own. It was not It was by the first naturalist who was in my position about seven years ago named Kelsey. And she started this Prairie Preschool program out of a strike of genius. And it has grown to, I average, about 50 parents per week that attend. And a lot of times I get get questions everything from why is pollination important to how does water get into rivers? And those are coming from parents. And we are not the only national or state park, I should say, that offers programs of this nature and i would i would definitely look at state parks that are close by or if you're going camping or even if you're just staying in a city that happens to have a state park and see what programs are offered and take time to tap the knowledge of the naturalists and the park rangers there they are more than happy to talk about their passion for the outdoors with you and if it comes to like oh what plants can my kids look at and touch and which ones can't they they can definitely help answer those questions as well as um, there's nonprofit groups that work with these different things as well. Um, and even if it comes to, say, gardening, uh, there's a program in this area called Grow Together. And so it's community gardening where anybody can show up. And as long as you show up a certain number of times throughout the season to help garden the area, you get to take a share of the produce, essentially, at the end. And there's 
programs like that all over the world. And so I'd say look to your local resources of nonprofits, of state parks, national parks, um, interpreters that teach these sort of things. And so tap into those resources because they are a wealth of knowledge um, and can show you a lot of things. And one last plug I have to give um, out of that pre preschool that I wish I could take credit for but cannot. Um, we actually had a group of parents in the Fargo-Moorhead area that started their own branch of the Free Forest School. Um, the Free Forest School is a training that you can get, you can go through as a parent, and it just gives you ideas and strategies for learning outside. And we now have a pretty extensive and thriving Free Forest School within the Fargo-Moorhead area where it's just parents getting together and exploring nature with their kids and they are an amazing group. If, you know, anyone is local to this area, they, you know, definitely they have a Facebook page that you can reach out to them. Otherwise, if there's any other interests, like we could definitely get them in contact or at least provide them with information on how to start those types of programs. And one big one that we haven't mentioned yet is extension. Oh, yes. There's lots of extension agents uh, and extension programs through universities across the United States that have an amazing wealth of knowledge and fact sheets and that is their job, is to get that information out to you, answer questions, um, and they do a fantastic job. Ah, my heart is just getting so toasty with all this <laughs> just talk of humans going outside and enjoying nature and learning about it. It's just wonderful. Um, so, yeah, we will include links to as much of that as we can in the show notes. We will also have ways to contact Christina and Paula. So if you need help on finding something else we can't get a direct link for, they can put you in touch with folks. Um, I also wanted to mention that this paper is getting a feature in CSA News, so we will have a link to that as well, as well as that crop science special issue that's coming up that is all about connecting public gardens and ag and all those different things to create these nice little networks that connect all of these issues together. Um, and then second question for you, uh, and I actually have a suggestion on this one based on our conversation, is how can people get involved? My suggestion being go for a walk or go outside <laughs> and look at plants. But I'm sure you guys have um, just much more advice that would be so wonderful. Please, please feel free to share it. Uh, one that I would recommend, since everyone loves their smartphone, except me, who is a current flip phone user, <laughs> I am diehard, um, is iNaturalist. It is a smartphone application that is actually really handy. Uh, what I found is a lot of times people don't pay attention to plants because they don't know what it is. And iNaturalist is a wonderful tool where if you take a photo of the plant through the app, it will actually give you suggestions as to what it is. And if it doesn't know what it is, it'll just mark it as unknown. And then people like me who like to do very geeky things in their free time will go through and help you identify it. Um, and it can be really helpful for scientists. It's actually a citizen science app where you can, um, we can download the data from it and then use it in mapping and creating things like uh, GIS maps and, and other things. Yeah, and I'd say I, I, at a base level, yes, go for a walk. Go outside somewhere. Go walk through a field only if you have permission. Don't walk on anybody's field if you don't. Um, but otherwise, work, walk in public areas. Um, look at look at the plants and look down. Um, look up if there's trees. Look down if there's plants on the ground. Um, but looking at those different things um, is a great way to start. If you become more interested in it, um, go talk to people. Get your kids involved is a huge thing just as a, a general parent um, or if you uh, volunteer with kids groups uh, through 4-H or whatever that might be, um, including plant knowledge as part of that. As well as at a bigger level, I mean, if you want to get involved volunteering at different places, getting um, in touch with extension and different groups to see what's done in your area, start a community garden. A new movement um, in some areas is putting out little planter free gardens in front of your yard, essentially, and so plant some things and then people can come by and see them as they grow, at, kind of like the little free library, except for it's a little free garden. And so they can also, as produce is produced, they can taste it. They can see it. It's more, it's not so much you're giving everybody produce, but they can hands-on see, feel, and touch. And so um, getting involved in those ways as well as at higher levels is all helpful. 
I love that. There was a guy up the street from us, and he put in, like, some raised garden beds one year, and it was, like, the the hot topic for my family was, like, what is this guy doing? What is he growing? Like, what are those plants? And, like, he grew pumpkins in his yard and tomatoes and stuff, and it was so cool to just get to see, I mean, especially pumpkins because those things just go nuts crazy um but it was so cool to get to see them grow and then one time I walked by and he was harvesting tomatoes and I just struck up a conversation with him and he's like do you want some and that was a that was a really cool experience for me to get to see that just see the plants grow throughout the season was was really cool so I love that idea I I have to chip in after you said that I've we my husband and I have become the crazy neighbors uh, in the neighborhood (laughs) right now because we just this year Rather than putting in flower beds all the way around our house, we put in basically it's called edible landscaping. We like to refer to it as our redneck garden, but it's now edible landscaping because that sounds a lot better. Uh, But basically (laughs) on one side of our house, we grew green beans in the back corner behind the garage. We grew tomatoes. We put in a strawberry patch. We had carrots. We had cucumbers. We have rhubarb. And it just it literally grows right in those flower beds right around your house. I mean, people think we're a little crazy at the moment, but there's other people getting really excited about it. And they were like, come pick the beans when we're gone. We went on vacation. Come pick beans. We don't need them. You know, they're going to keep growing. And so it's a talking piece. That is lovely. You might be the weird neighbors, but you're also going to be the popular neighbors when people <laughs> people are preparing a salad. So it's a great talking point. And all of your just little animal neighbors, I'm sure, just love your place. Oh, yes. They, they haven't gotten too bad yet. They haven't gotten out of control. But, yeah, it, that will come too. Yes. Yeah. The, the word will get out. <laughs> well, excellent. Those are some great ideas to get involved. I am definitely going to look into that myself. I have had an increasing interest in gardening myself since working here. So maybe I'll, I'll take a college try at it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so then final question for you. What is one fun fact that people wouldn't know about you if all they had was your research? Um, well, I will, I'll lead off. Uh, so at age 24, I decided that I needed to become a ballerina and I've been taking ballet since that point in time. And at age 34, I decided that I should try to dance on point because that's a normal thing for a 34 year old woman to decide to do. But at this point, I am hopefully going to be able to dance on point in some sort of local performance in the near future. So I am an ancient ballerina. That is delightful. Dancing is the best. Dance buddies. <laughs> so for me, I I have, I've, I've mentioned my husband in our house, but we have three little kids. Um, we have a dog and a hamster named Chubby Hammy Little Bear because my kids could not decide on a name for it. And so they each gave it a name and we have five fish. Um, and yet, We keep all that together, but yet every morning when I come downstairs, I lose my socks. I bring them downstairs, and I set them somewhere, and every single morning I lose them. And since I've told a couple people that, they agree that they have those sorts of... So, I mean, we can have a PhD. We can be, you know, do great research, but we're still just normal, crazy people. My socks don't match right now, if that makes you feel better. Awesome. Awesome. (laughs) Mine might have holes in them, too. I think they're also Harry Potter socks. Yes. Oh, yeah. I, I have a weird fascination with Harry Potter. I love Harry Potter. That's why it's in the paper. (laughs) Yep. I was very proud of that being in the paper. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. That is amazing. And maybe maybe the hamster's taking the socks. You don't know. (laughs) Maybe he is. Maybe. You've got got that many moving bodies in there. (laughs) Little Chubby is getting out and getting the the socks. (laughs) Uh, What a cute name for a hamster. Well, this has been... Such a blast. Absolutely love this conversation. Thank you so much for the work that you guys are doing. Thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your expertise on apparently every kind of field of study and (laughs) school subject that exists because we covered almost all of them. So, yeah, thank you so much. What a great time. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for listening to Field Lab Earth. You'll find a link to today's paper and other resources for this episode in our show notes or on our website. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for show topics, please contact us at podcast at sciencesocieties.org or on Twitter at Field Lab Earth. 
If you'd like to hear more content like this, please subscribe. And don't forget to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or anywhere else you find your podcasts if you like our show. This podcast is a joint production of the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, and Soil Science Society of America. Special thanks to Lobo Loco for the use of their song Spook Castle on the intro and outro of our show. Opinions and conclusions expressed by authors are their own and are not considered as those of the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, Soil Science Society of America, its staff, its members, or its advertisers.